You presume to dictate duty to me? Have you any idea what the cost of your actions is? What their effect might be? Who are you to give them hope? What do you give them? We give them happiness. And they give us authority. The authority to take away their freedom under the guise of democracy. Men can never be free. Because they're weak, corrupt, worthless, and restless. The people believe in authority. They've grown tired of waiting for miracle and mystery. Science is their religion. No greater explanation exists for them. They must never believe any differently if the project is to go forward. At what cost to them? The question's irrelevant and the outcome inevitable. The date is set. Most of them have ceased to believe in God. Why? Because God presents them with no miracles during their faith. You think when man ceases to believe in miracles, he rejects God? Of course. You rule over them in God's name. They don't believe in him, but they still fear him. They're afraid not to because they're afraid of freedom. And you give them happiness. We appease their conscience. Anyone who can appease a man's conscience can take his freedom away from him. And if you can't appease their conscience, you kill them. But you can't kill them all. You can't kill their love, which is what makes them who they are. Makes them better than us. Better than you. The Gnostic impulse has existed since the time man realized he was in thrall of wickedness in high places. The Gnostic impulse appeared and became the foundation of Plato's allegory of the cave, as well as the myth of Prometheus. It existed in the magical, musical, but somber tenets of the cult of Orpheus. It shone behind Buddha's smile as he faced the demiurgic Mara. It rose like a banner when Zarathustra declared we were meant to connect to our higher selves or devas. Even as light and darkness battled high above in the cosmos. And later manifested with Zervanism that correctly claimed Ahriman was the lord of the universe. The Gnostic impulse simmered in the book of Enoch and in the madness of Paul as he described in 1 Corinthians 2 how a hidden Sophia was rising against the archons of this age. It exploded with Simon Magus and Helen, so fierce that an entire dominant religion called Christianity had to be created by Yes, the archons of this age. All to silence their message. I'd rather die than go to heaven. But the Gnostic impulse continued like a holy coronavirus. Like the plasmate of Philip K. Dick. Manifesting in the Persian Mazdakites, the Assassin's Creed, the ecstatic Sufis the Templars, the Cathars, and the Bogomils and the Manichaeans, and through many secret societies hiding the contraband and dangerous promise of Simon Magus and Ellen. One day you'll realize that you've had not just one or two past or future existences, but that you were and are everybody and everything that has ever been or will ever be. And the Gnostic impulse emerged in more places and through more brave lips, daring to speak about the fake reality around us. From Moby Dick to Blood Meridian, from Carl Jung to Robert Frost, writing about the Demiurge's laughter, and a lot of movies and video games we've discussed before. The Gnostic impulse has always been there for you to take.
but few grasp it because it means madness and liberation at once. And it tells us to lift the veil and see the great oppression that has been placed upon our divine sparks for untold millennia. Nobody left almost to remind them that there once was a species called a human being with feelings and thoughts and that history and memory are right now being erased and soon nobody will really remember that life existed on the planet. That clip at the beginning from the X-Files, that revealing dialogue between the cigarette-smoking man and the captured alien, is so true and part of the Gnostic impulse. That madness and liberation as you finally open your eyes to see the darkness all around you, but gaze for power beyond the stars. As the recovery saying goes, Once I accept things as they are, I can create things as they might be. If we live our lives the right way, then every single thing we do becomes a work of art. As Hermes Trismegisto said, describing the entirety of our plight, Bright and luminous as you are, oh so, by your own nature, you went to the world of darkness and engage in combat with it. And the world of darkness obscured your light and encompassed you with darkness and blinded you and made you lose sight of all that you had seen and forget all that you had known. And in the end, you were captured and held prisoner. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. All what I've said is exemplified with our astral guest, James True who materializes at the Virtual Alexandria to discuss his book, The Technology of Belief. An electric interview on a thunderous book that is at once poetic, well-researched, philosophical, and all in all a red pill suppository we all need. If we want to create things as they might be, James pulls no punches and punches Yaldi Baldi right in the Mufasa face. Look, Simba. In the end, you'll realize that the programming is worse than you could have ever dreamed, and the establishment more psychotic than you could have ever imagined. But hey, that's the good news, because we got them right where we want them in plain third eye sight. And in a narrative, we now control because we accept reality as it is and grasp the Gnostic impulse. That mythic narrative of madness and liberation. Yes, these are bruises from fighting. Yes, I'm comfortable with that. I am enlightened. It's either that or a horrible story will be written for us as it's always been written by the victors of history. In that story, the Night King will have killed Bronn. Sophia will remain hidden from the Archons of this age instead of taking her Athena form and starting an apocalypse of the mind. What does he want? An endless night? He wants to erase this world, and I am its memory. That's what death is, isn't it? Forgetting, being forgotten. If we forget where we've been and what we've done, we're not men anymore, just animals. But that's why you have arrived at the virtual Alexandria, along with James, here at Aeon by Gnostic Radio. You need that pompadus of gnosis, as much as I do, your host, Miguel Connor. And together we soak in the contraband and dangerous information of astral guests each week. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. Here is some of James's narrative from his book, The Technology of Belief. 
Words are poor as a poet. All of our thoughts are slippery fish flopping on the dock. We put our hooks in their gums and pull them out to show each other what we thought. Meaning is a colored koi squiggling through our fingers. We lose its intention, pretending to hold oceans in cups. Utterance is a drop in the sea of every thought that ever was. We are neurons on this omnidirectional train track of prejudice. God is zero point back at the station. Our identity is a vector as much as it is a pulse. We are surging streams through time and space. If you want to know how God sees you, take a snapshot of every pose your body's ever held and connect the dots. Make a map of every geo-coordinate you've occupied. What does your time body resemble in its true form? What are time squiggles? Like three-dimensional ink from a calligrapher's pen are spline tapers, splotches, and zips along a baseline. We are the song of the deep for the highest of places. The quest is to be liberated from the negative, which is really our own will to nothingness. And once having said yes to the instant, the affirmation is contagious. It bursts into a chain of affirmations that knows no limit. To say yes to one instant is to say yes to all of existence. That's just a taste of James's gnosis. It's time you unleash your gnosis and see beyond the stars. Great things as they might be. And keep this in mind. It's always easier to reduce the world to good and bad guys. But that's the ultimate trap of the Archons of this age. That is, simplicity and divide and conquer duality. As Jung said, The devil is the ultimate dualist, forever making one into two. If the devil himself walked this earth, he'd surely be working in PR. Furthermore, it's not so much about good and bad guys, but at what point in the machine every soul is trapped in. Like Neo in his pod. And how they reflect something in you that you once were, or could easily be again. Where are you in the machine? Hopefully deprogramming yourself from the technology of belief. This is a marketing holocaust. 24 hours a day, for the rest of our lives, the powers that be are hard at work, dumbing us to death. We end both partial and full episodes with a song called High Sea by a true seeker warrior and excellent artist called Coin Locker. Please enjoy. And thanks for being here and all the support you provide every week including amazing movie clips. I couldn't share this Gnostic impulse without you. Let us do the interview with James True. You're not real. You're not real. What? You are? Is any of it real? I mean, look at this. Look at it! A world built on fantasy. Synthetic emotions in the form of pills. Psychological warfare in the form of advertising. Mind-altering chemicals in the form of food. Brainwashing seminars in the form of media. Control isolated bubbles in the form of social networks. Real? You want to talk about reality? We haven't lived in anything remotely close to it since the turn of the century. 
We turned it off. We got the battery snacked on a bag of GMOs while we tossed the remnants in the ever-expanding dumpster of the human kingdom. Look at these branded houses, trademarked by corporations built on bipolar numbers, jumping up and down on digital displays, hypnotizing us into the biggest slumber mankind has ever seen. Just to dig pretty deep, kiddo, before you can find anything where you live in a kingdom of bullshit. This is the A on Byte interview, and with us, we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by James True to discuss his book, The Technology of Belief, as well as some of his other works and many of his ideas. James, thank you very much for coming on A on Byte. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. It's really great to be here. Thank you. Pleasure is all ours. And with us, as always, we've got the Moondog, Vance Sachi. How you doing, Vance? I'm doing good. I'm very excited about this because I am one of many people who are assaulted when you listen to the media with all the attempts at washing my mind. So <laughs> yeah, here we a, go. Yeah, it's a constant thing. It's almost 20, it's 24 seven. I mean, it really is. And I'm really happy, James, that I read your book. Uh, as I told you, this book was an experience. It was a book that was philosophical, it was poetic, it was full of data, it was full of insight. It was an incredible read. And is there a way we can put this book in a genre? Or uh, how do you come about writing something like this that's, you know, has a lot of internal narrative, it's not chronological, it goes back into ancient history and then moves to the present? What genre could we call this? Um, I, I probably the loosely would, would refer to it as pulp nonfiction. And I combine those two together because the nonfiction is the truth, but it's the pulp is the pulp of that truth. <clears throat> I believe that in today's world, what we need is a tinctured approach to ingesting new information. We have such a, a fast paced world now that um, readers typically you're not willing to give you the amount of time that say an old author would get. Um, today's a different kind of world. So um, I use emotional uh, framing because I find it's the most efficient and quick way I can place someone empathically inside a truth that I need them to see so that then they can move on to the next step and understand how these all tie together. And, and that's ultimately why I called it the technology of belief, because it, it's this really is a legitimate technology that's at work uh, against us in, in, in most ways. Um, it, it's a technology that's that's been unwound, but has been known and documented for thousands of years, probably a lot longer but there's a lot of speculation that has to go into it once I start talking about anything before 7,000 years ago. Yes, I love the way you do it because, for example, uh, we get into this really touching emotional chapter about Medusa, the priestess, and then you take us to the present. And it's a sort of a journey we take. So I think it's perfect. Like you said, it gets you in the mood. It breaks you out of your normative consciousness, but it also brings in a lot of beauty and elegance into it philosophically and poetically. So it's amazing. And I guess the question for you, James, is when did you realize that you were programmed or were you always this sort of curious soul? Um, I, I would say that like, like all of us, I believe that for most of my life that I was simply broken and, and didn't understand things and wasn't very good at uh, conforming and fitting into uh, the normalcy. And only after some, some of my own personal trauma, the, the, the kind of trauma that all of us would go through, um, just sometimes you have just the right amount. Uh, are, are we allowed to kind of be sh woken up or shaken in such a way where we find ourselves looking at the world in a different light purely for survival reasons, purely for the, the concept of how do I survive now after all of this is happening? And, and there's a liberation that comes when you become so uh, broken that you have to rebuild your world because you no longer feel uh, like you have anything to lose, which means you're able to kind of shed all the chemical 
uh, re- uh, receptors that we have that that make up what we call mind control. Um, it, really quick, I, I, I think mind control is more chemical control. I don't think this has anything to do with rational thoughts. This is more about reward systems, serotonin, uh, dopamine flow, and its restriction. And when you go through enough trauma, all those pathways, all of that chemis- the, all of that chemical economy is reset. Um, I, I think the classic schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic, someone who's diagnosed with that is really just someone who's entered into this state and they really haven't been able to break out of it. They are in a complete state of insanity is all around me. What the hell am I going to do now? And it's only then where we can either find that power to to replace our assemblage point back inside our center or we're going to instead fall prey to uh, someone else's cure about how to make us more malleable uh, you know, to this insane world that we live in. Indeed. I mean, in uh, one part you write, uh, the blueprint of mind control, and it's one, break target, two, constrict aid, three, harvest life force. So basically, it really starts, they, they have to traumatize us first, right? And some of us actually, minority pivot to the right place, to a place of individuality and the truth, or how does it work, James? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Um, the the whole key, m- the book I wrote before Technology Belief is called The Blueprint of Mind Control, and it, it basically just expands on that exact same three-step approach. I'm really glad you brought that up because those same three steps were looked at in religion through sin, in academia through ignorance, and in society through uh, acceptance and virtue. And all all of these techniques are are bent in exactly the same way, and all of them have exactly the same endpoint, which is that you end up with either a serotonin restriction or a serotonin flow purely by the consequences of what it is you're going to believe or not believe in society. So we've set up a world now where we self-hatred is rewarded through virtue. This is uh, something called virtue licking, where we find ourselves um, flogging ourselves in public in exchange for the reward of serotonin from the group. So we've created a a community of masochism, and and we reward each other for that masochism. This is the heart of racism. This is the heart of being called a sinner. This is the heart of being called a xenophobe. Uh, this is the heart of even being called uh, uh, e- e- you have too much ego. Um, all of these are psychic gelding techniques that are colossally important to a rancher when it comes to managing his herd in, a, in, a, in an effective way that, that helps him and the herd in a sense where everyone conforms to the, the group insanity um, and people become more docile and basically just just live with it. Yeah, it definitely happens today. So you're talking about the the rewards. What are the rewards we get for this virtual signaling or victimhood? Can we think as simple as likes, shares, and all that? Or what's traditionally, what's the reward? Uh, just yesterday, Jonah Hill was uh, quoted. He's a Hollywood director. He basically wrote a quote that's saying, until the white man relinquishes his power there can be no peace or something like that. It, it, that is a statement where he's literally emasking, you know, emasculating his own race, his own skin in public, and he's being rewarded for that by being placed on the pedestal. And so what ends up happening is, is everyone else sees that prana. This is a prana economy. This is underneath all of our words is this movement of energy. And this movement of energy is truly what motivates us and causes us to um, conform into different groups. We pretend that it's because we have a rational uh, epiphany. But in fact, what we've done is we've negotiated our prana economy to receive more energy, i.e. belief, from the crowd around us. So we're willing to conform our thoughts Uh, to fit into that genre but none of us are really able to admit that Uh, we're we're stuck in this illusion that we have gnosis that we have this knowledge um, that 
that allows us to uh, kind of overcome our emotions. And what I'm arguing is, is that it's actually completely inverted from that. We make our decisions based on the prana economy that we're going to receive, and then we build an, a, a rational ladder um, it, that justifies our trance state to then explain to people, well, no, I'm just you know logically following the the scientific method here, <laughs> when in fact it, it's it's not that at all. The, the keel of the ship is always underneath the water. That's the thing that's carving and moving you uh, through the water. It's the sails. All the sails are really doing is collecting the wind and pushing. It's what's underneath the water that's truly steering us. And I think in a lot of ways our psyche works works exactly the same way. Our controllers know this. I, I use controllers loosely because I, I I don't think there's an actual them. It's it's more of a, a an archetypal uh, rising to the surface of psychopathy that that ends up controlling us uh, quite by by almost by nature. So it's not like they have an agenda and they are a guy named this or a person named that. It's more about just the way this world works. The ether, the 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 energy that we have is meant to to be this almost blender, this alchemical blender of pain and trauma, which are two different things uh, th that are contrasted with joy and epiphany. And that's what's causing all these things to happen beneath. Again, this is all beneath the surface. It's our rationality that's kind of used to justify it, almost comfort us into believing that we have 100% free will. We do have free will. However, this free will is really more based on our prana, the prana economy that we, we're willing to have and negotiate with our world. Um, it, this has a lot to do with sociology. If you think about the different roles that you enter, um, if you're a second child, maybe you might be more prone to, say, being a scapegoat, where if you're like the first child, you might be more prone to being like a golden child. These are, are really good examples of what I mean by describing the prana economy underneath. The family structure will justify and explain why the golden child happens to be the golden child in this way. But actually, this negotiation happened a long time ago. It was more of an energetic chemical negotiation that this, that the group uh, went through. And they're basically just making up excuses to justify what had already been decided deep underneath the water where, where the keel sits. So there are no ranchers? No? <laughs> it's not that there's no ranchers. It's that the ranchers are not cognizant. In, a, in, in my opinion, the ranchers are not as cognizant as, as we might think they were. Because if they were cognizant, it would mean that they would have to be really clever about not letting their motives slip out. And, and I think what we find is, is that the best way to keep a secret is to make the person who's keeping it completely ignorant of that secret. And I believe that there is probably a Kabbalistic uh, ancient – this is all speculation at this point. But there's, there, I think there is an ancient code book or codex to how to control – a human. It's the crook and the flail of the pharaoh, these two different tools. The the crook is a gentle hook that you would use to pull a sheep into you, while the flail is is quite a violent cat of nine tails that you would use to to send a sheep away from you. These these two tools um, are as close as you can get to seeing like a conscious entity controlling us. It's more about this is a, a psychopathy playbook that's going to naturally arise in anyone who has evacuated themselves enough to step into that role and become uh, a, a wielder of power, basically. So anyone who's in power is going to have to be someone who has in some way evacuated their own empathy in favor of the machine. If they, if they did not evacuate themselves, they are going to have a constant conflict uh, within themselves where they're battling for their own sovereignty versus uh, sort of becoming a, a, a slave to the machine. The, the, it's almost like they've exchanged the walk on part and the war for a lead role in the cage. It's very much just like that Love lyric. <laughs> Think about it. You know? yeah. You're exchanging that for that lead role in the cage, which really means that you're, you're violating your own sovereignty, which is only going to be comfortable chemically. Keep in mind, this is a chemical decision that we've made. So that's only going to be comfortable to someone who is ready to evacuate themselves. And they're only going to evacuate themselves if there's enough dissonance 
and enough trauma programming through someone's life to make it just simply too uncomfortable to stay inside someone's pelvis. They'd rather just leave and escape. And that's really when they start to be rewarded. It's almost like they're shucking us like oysters because they can reward you to go ahead and open up and just let the sea come in. And uh, l- let's turn that pearl into a problem is what they're doing. And they're like, oh, let's 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 take that burden off of you when really the whole time that treasure has been inside you the whole time. But you've been convinced that it's a problem. You've been convinced you're broken. You've been convinced that basically the only solution is to let that knife come in and just pop you open and uh, wash yourself away. That's the ultimate form of disassociation. And that really is the most uh, that's the easiest way to psychically geld someone to uh, no different than cutting the balls off a bull, no different than neutering a dog. No different than circumcising a man. It, these are gelding techniques. And once a man's gelded with enough trauma, they become docile, predictable, and uh, easy to manage. They're, they're like a crop, basically. Well said. Uh, and, of course, I love the Pink Floyd reference. Wish you were here. Uh, powerful words. That, but how do they geld us? I mean, people who listen to the show might think MK Ultra, the church, all that. But I think it's this is sort of a, a holistic machine from going to school to going to church to everything else. Is that how they traumatize us? You were, you were born into this system. So this system uh, is much more prevalent. I actually think MK Ultra. Is, so not that MK Ultra is not real, because uh, it, it is, but I'm talking about something much more personal than that. Um, there. So epigenetically, we can hold and pass down trauma, and we can also epigenetically hold and pass down wisdom. And so um, as you start to implant dissonance into a machine. Let's say, for example, you decide that you're going to kill all families firstborn um, thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, A couple things happen when you kill the firstborn. So first of all, you you kill the firstborn, which should be enough. But but if you actually look at what happens, there's something really profound happens because now the second child, the second male, let's say, would inherit – the role of the first child. So now that person is forever in a state of, I have something that did not belong to me initially. It, 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 I've, been, I've inherited something that was not necessarily mine. I've inherited it through trauma. I've inherited it through the death and misfortune of someone else. So the second that happens, Now, all of those families, all of their bloodline, every single epigenetic tree now has this uh, dissonant vibration, an oscillation that's been implanted inside the DNA that says, I am not worthy of this. I am. I have survivor syndrome, for example. That's another way it shows itself, where they feel guilty for being the one that survived. This is an oscillation that now is is stored in the DNA, very much like a software program. It, it's literally a demon in the computer sense, D-A-E-M-O-N, which is a a living computer ghost that's job is to to fire off a program every now and then. Well, these programs can exist inside your DNA. And that program is one of, I am not worthy. This is uh, reinforced through the trauma. So it will take generation after generation after generation. And that oscillation can still stay inside those genes. Why? Because imagine that that second child, the Loki figure basically now is inheriting something that he doesn't feel worthy for, that he feels guilty for. He's now oscillating that guilt inside of himself. He, When he has sex with his wife, that oscillation is being installed inside of her too. Um, If they were to have a child, those genes would be installed with that exact same isolation. We are the byproduct of our creators. In this case, the stargate, our mother, the seed, our father. That's now been installed inside of our own psyche too. So we wake up with epigenetic trauma when we're born, but we really have no clue it's even there. Mainly because we're told that everything's about rational thoughts and that we're not really told to tie into our roots 
there's a lot of amnesia that occurs in our society on purpose. That amnesia is very important because if you can install trauma and then make someone not be able to find it, uh, imagine putting a splinter in the paw of a lion, but somehow the lion couldn't figure out where the splinter was. That, that, that's your perfect uh, seed because now you have someone that doesn't even know uh, what the problem is. They don't know why they have this trauma, and that's going to cause the dissonance uh, to really skyrocket inside themselves, and they're going to start acting out from that from that epigenetic uh, virus, basically. So these are viruses that are installed in a much more personal way than MK Ultra. Um, yes, they are reinforced all the time. You know, I would say by age four, most of us in the quote quote first world or civilized world are going to be induced into trauma programming. I think that's why uh, Europe requires compulsory education. I, I think they're going as low as age two right now in in France or Germany, one or the other. It's literally illegal to homeschool your child because they need that separation. They need the abandonment that takes place at such a young age where the child is leaving uh, the farm. That this is, these are all dissonance slash amnesia techniques that are just meant to, to keep that same spell that's been installed so long ago, that first trauma oscillation. So if you keep adding oscillations, if you keep adding dissonance, it's just going to get louder and louder and louder inside of our own genes where we're no longer able to even listen to our own epigenetic wisdom anymore. Why? Because trauma makes a lot more noise than wisdom does. Trauma is more of a, hey, man, you got to take care of this right now. Wisdom is more of like, the birds have a lesson for you. You know, <laughs> that's going to be a priority there, you know, that happens. So it's economical. It's very similar to sugar. If you think about how the differences between how sugar affects the body and say uh, a, a really good vegetable or an avocado, it's very similar. The wisdom is the avocado and this trauma is the sugar. It's going to hit your system right away. The shock's going to be overpowering and you're not really ever going to be able to understand the taste of the avocado because you, you've got a permanent sugar fix that's happening in your mouth 24-7. So it really throws you off and that throwing you off, that's the psychic gelding that, that I was alluding to earlier. It, it's, it's the equivalent of snapping the balls off a bull in the, the, our balls are in our, our assemblage point. Our balls are in our awareness where our center is. And most of the time when you can evacuate, when you can shuck someone, what you're really doing is causing the awareness to leave the body and it starts to stalk the, the self from outside itself. So uh, imagine you imagine your body is a three-dimensional record and you've got a needle, a diamond needle, and that needle is your awareness point. Uh, Carlos Castaneda talks about this. He calls it the assemblage point. But imagine that's in the center of your heart. Uh, from that center, it, you're going to find that inside your torus, you're going to see the world through your own eyes, through your own essence, and you're going to have a much better time at it. But if you've been say traumatized in some way, you're going to, that assemblage point can leave the body. You can start to look at yourself from outside yourself. This is projection and this is disassociation. Uh, afterlife is very much a uh, believing in the afterlife, believing that, that if, if I can just make it till I'm dead, things will be okay because in the afterlife, I will have this better situation in a way that's a form of this disassociation you're taking your awareness you're taking your assemblage point your center and it's leaving the body and you're placing it in someone else whether that be the state who's going to save you the wife who's going to finally love you when you didn't love yourself or the child who's going to honor you by by fulfilling your destiny all of these are situations where we can lose ourselves where we're coaxed we're rewarded for taking our assemblage point and making it leave the body, looking at ourselves critically, for example, through um, the masochism um, and then getting credit for it. That's another way of just pulling that assemblage point further and further away. The further that gets away, you now have a vacant spot inside your cockpit. 
that vacancy can be filled very easily with a zeitgeist vibration. Um, you know, it, it, that's when you're going to be rewarded. If you, if you like the right kind of music, you're going to be scolded or humiliated. If you like the wrong kind of music, that, that's a superficial example. But if you just follow that on up, you'll see that, you know, that's that prana economy that's running underneath. I will be accepted by accepting the right things. I will be rejected by not rejecting the right things. That's the same crook and flail that's at play. Once the assemblage point is outside the body, you can use these tools very easily to manipulate millions and millions of people simply by telling them, we have to kill this people because he's a terrorist. We have to kill this country because they're evil. We have to do this because of that. It's All these things become easier because we are now functioning on the prana economy of, I just want to be accepted. So if I walk into an airport and someone calls me a hero that I've never met, or if I'm having my dinner paid for by a stranger that I've never met, that's enough serotonin to make someone that feels really shitty because of their grandfather or their great, great, great grandfather uh, participated in a war and committed homicide for no reasons that were not his own. That same epigenetic trauma is still echoing, which means it's going to be much easier for a free dinner to be all it takes to convince someone I'm going to enlist. I want to have honor. I want to have fame. I want to have reputation, whatever it is. You see the same thing in, in Hollywood. Uh, imagine the young person. He goes out to Hollywood to be a big star. What's the first thing he does? He abandons his real name. He picks a new one. He picks a stage name now. What's the second thing he does? He uh, completely changes his look in his body. He takes a headshot. He puts his head in a weird angle, cricks his neck in a strange, whatever it takes, he's willing to do because he wants to be discovered. Think about that word discovered. He's lost. He wants to be discovered. I mean, it's literally showing you the, the hero's journey. It's showing you exactly what's happening. Like it's right in front of your face, but we're not able to see it. We're not able to understand that that Hollywood is a shucking of that oyster. It's a disassociation. It's a pulling apart of the body from the mind, pretending those are now two separate things and literally eviscerating both of them uh, to, to serve a, a greater purpose. The machine creating more of this limelight um, drug, creating more of this virtue suckling uh, behavior which all of us really can't help but but be brought up around and see the benefits of that doing it. it it's it's an awful system but it doesn't have to be one person in charge who's literally pushing the button you know it's very much a, a system that kind of runs itself automatically because it's underneath the surface mm, that was really well said james and powerful too I, i'm thinking uh, you quote gore vidal in your book where he says i'm not joking when i refer to our country as the united states of amnesia because yes like you said they've made us forget and it also reminds me when i had i talked to chris knows on this show he talked about the spartans how they would take away the kids at an early age and put them in very traumatic situations beyond just ripping them away from the mother yeah. and that created the this incredible society of warriors that withstood centuries of outside interference and invasion until the romans finally broke their backs but so basically, this is sort of a technology that has been passed around. I mean, uh, some people might be saying, well, is there a, a demiurge or a Wizard of Oz or an alien force? But isn't this just good marketing that has been passed around since ancient times and given to those in power to make sure that the subjects are fine and docile? I would say that not only is it given to the elites, but it's more in like it's installed inside the elites. And the, uh, the Watiko is a Native American term for this. It's this moral cannibalism that, that occurs. And once you can evacu, uh, once you can evacuate the self, you create a self actualizing motor, a trauma motor. Um, one of the articles in, in, in the book is called The First Supper. And it's, it's a look at, uh, Saturn. Uh, and, and the first case of cannibalism. Now, this is a mythological story that I'm telling, but it really does explain what happens. And I do believe that cannibalism is a, obviously the, the ultimate form of trauma programming, because if you can convince a human to eat another human, you've reduced humanity to uh, a pellet, a packet of energy that can be picked up. And I don't think that one human can recover from that. that. That's why cannibalism was so important in the elite world. The archetype of the lion was actually a symbol of, 
I was willing to eat anything else below me. That's what made me the lion is that I could eat you. <laughs> and so the first supper is this <laughs> idea of Saturn taking his son Tiamat in front of all of his other children and flailing him and making the rest of his children eat Tiamat. Why is he doing that? Because Saturn wants to live forever. He wants his name to be preserved through the annals of time. And the only way he can preserve that name is to take away the free will of his family so that their focus becomes nothing more than immortalizing him. He takes over his entire bloodline through self-cannibalism, installs that trauma programming, and now forever and ever, each of those children are now spinning in what they've done. They ate their own brother in front of their father in order to survive. So now their survival is forever haunted by this trauma. It's been epigenetically installed in that system. If you take Saturn's family, uh, I'm talking about symbolically here, but if you take Saturn's family and picture what that would be like from generation to generation to generation, you then look at the real life story of Vlad the Impaler, something that actually happened where every morning he was a new body was placed on a pike and he would dip bread into the blood of these bleeding victims and drink it. You have an addiction now that's been passed down for centuries, millennium, maybe even longer. It's such a, a deep-seated addiction that the uh, person who has it is now empowered by it. It's no longer something that takes away their life. Instead, it becomes who they are. It becomes their essence. And this is what I mean by it's not really a conscious thing. It's not really like Rockefeller said, I'm going to be the evilest guy in the world, although he did. <laughs> he did, kind of. But the point is, is that this would have happened regardless of whether someone was conscious of it or not, because if you wait long enough, you're going to see some kind of trauma is going to enter this the scenario of this world that's going to cause that that could have even been an accident. This is why I think this system of trauma and lies is not a broken system. I believe this system is inherently important to what we are here to do. This is almost like an alchemical blender or an alchemical machine that we're all thrown into where we're turning ourselves from lead until gold into gold. The, uh, the lead would be the, the trauma that's, that's installed in us and the gold would be our ability to not tarnish in that trauma. So since I've had this new kind of revelation, personal revelation about this, it's really made me look at the world in a much more uh, comfortable way. I no longer have to see the world as broken. I more see it as a functioning machine, as a, almost a tumbler, a rock tumbler, where you stick the sharp rocks in and these nice, smooth, shiny rocks come out. The, in other words, there's a purpose to all of this evil. And that purpose uh, has a much longer term uh, goal in mind that that we – I don't think we're really ever able to to fully understand or grasp. Yeah, that was my next question, James. How do you stay positive? For example, when people go to me, well, you're into this Gnostic stuff. It's so dark. And I said, man, that's the best news I've ever heard. Because once I realize I'm a slave, I'm going to do something. Or when I realized I was an alcoholic, it was the best news I'd ever heard because I was going to start fighting. How do you stay positive? Uh, well, for a while I didn't because for a while I thought the, this machine was broken. But once I understand that this machine is a is a maybe a necessary alchemical uh, device, um, I can begin to use it to better myself um, in the best way possible. Which means I'm able to now look at my own trauma and understand that wait a minute, this is an echo, and just like just like a just like a piano string can ring by striking a key, it, it can be dampened by stopping it. And the trauma works in the same way. And once I understand that it's not that the world is out to get me, it's that the world is out to refine me, I can look at trauma in a much more therapeutic way, and I don't find myself depressed about it anymore. Uh, the only thing that really depresses me now is just more about just the struggles of living in, in literal insanity and tr just trying to maintain you know, your center inside of that but but ultimately that's that's what we're here to do that's you know that that's why we're here so in, in a way I, I feel like i found my purpose um and once you feel that you have that purpose or that you have that goal or task it's it's hard to to really 
you know, uh, get depressed about that because you have something to work on every day. You're not just lost. Like what the hell's happening? Oh, evil's <laughs> everywhere. Oh my God. What are we going to do? You have to be evil yourself. <laughs> it's a different thing. I'm having a completely different conversation with myself and I'm able to extend more empathy to other people because I'm able to see the canyon of trauma and the echoes that are bouncing across the walls inside this canyon that have been shouted years and years and years ago. You know, the person that's that's in trauma now is really more of a, a sounding board resonating in that same frequency as as maybe one of their own ancestors. They just don't even know it yet. So, you know, that that gives you more empathy when, when you can look at someone like that. Oh, indeed. I'm glad you're doing it. And uh, your book pulls no punches on any religion, uh, government, uh, you name it. And you, I also see you on Twitter a lot and you're getting reported and everything. And you're just asking questions. You're just like machine gunning questions and ideas. Cause, and I know what you're doing and I know how the machine is reacting towards you. And a uh, very, uh, let me quote, uh, your book is so quotable. I've got quotes all over, but you write, our school books insist America ended slavery during the Civil War, but real slavery has nothing to do with change. Slavery is the hijacking of identity. So that's, that's, that's it too. And the other question too is you, you talk about trauma and all that, but also one of your other features of the technology you belief is blackmail. Hasn't that been going on since centuries and thousands of years? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really vital tool. It's it's uh, it's the scaffolding that holds psychopathy together. Without blackmail, there would there would be no functioning government. There would be no honor among thieves. Quote quote. Uh, blackmail is a very crucial tool because uh, psychopaths can't trust each other. They, they they that would be the the stupidest thing you could do is to trust a psychopath. <laughs> so instead, what you have to do is you have to create a mutually destructive atmosphere. You have to create a situation where both sides are exposed in some way. This creates a loyalty uh, that you could never create in any other way among psycho psychopaths. If it wasn't for blackmail, the quote unquote good guys would be winning. Why? Because the psychopaths couldn't form groups. They could not form their own mafia. But because they have that, um, that is really their – that's their glue. And that glue is vital to them. Um, blackmail is not a, 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 uh, symptom of sickness. Blackmail is an architectural tool that's vital to the psycho psychopathic network functioning, thriving, growing, and ultimately controlling us. Yeah, and it's been going on, and it is going on, even as we seek. But you also talk about evil, but you do define evil in your book, James. You call it, it is the eviction of life. It is the hollowing out of one's spiritual core. This includes psychopathy, sociopathy, and narcissism. It's the soul that's checked out on the train. And like you said, they don't go about becoming evil. It's programmed that they're going to be the next generation of evil. Yes. I, I like the uh, Rockefellers. You you yeah. have a lot of about the Rockefellers in your book. There is a lot to the Rockefellers and um in addition, I, I say that in addition because the Rockefellers are a special instrument of um the next Tower of Babel, which which is kind of a separate thing inside of this evil. Uh we we rebuilt the Tower of Babel every uh I'll just say 26,000 years J just to, just to give us something to, to kind of stick our fingers into. Okay. Like every 26,000 years, we rebuild a new tower of Babel and that tower of Babel is um, it, it has a language, a universal language of zeros and ones. It's what we're calling the binary language is actually Babel itself. It's Babel speak. It's a language which all of us can share um, and we can connect with underneath it. This Tower of Babel is building itself. Um, it looks like Zionism. If you're looking at politics, it, it, would, it would look like Zionism. However, it's much deeper than that. But this globalistic tower, this central structure, this central uh, obelisk is uh, symbolically, archetypally, historically, and resonantly, like fractally resonantly, uh, destined to, to occur. 
So it doesn't require Rockefeller, but it does require a Rockefeller vessel to fulfill itself. So Rockefeller just happened to be in the right place um, at the right time. So this tower rebuilds itself over and over. And I believe that that's what we have, what we call the singularity in AI, that, that basically what, we're, what we think of as the singularity in AI is sort of when the tower is complete. And when the tower is complete, you have a Lucifer type figure. In other words, someone who is pure light. But to be pure light would be to have omniscience. To have omniscience would be to have the computing power to outpredict anyone else's ability to predict. Because intelligence is the ability to simulate an environment and predict all the variables inside that environment. So if you had a supercomputer, and I'm talking about a super, super computer here, a biological a uh, chemical supercomputer that could outpredict anything else in the world, that would be an omniscient creature. That omniscient creature is the Lucifer. It is the next rising Lucifer. It knows all because it sees all. It's a figure of light. It's a creature of light. Now, I'd like you to imagine yourself say, and I'm using him as an example. I'm not, I'm not at all trying to say it is Eric Schmidt. But Eric Schmidt is someone who ran Google and then ran Alphabet and is now employed by the Pentagon. He's worth about maybe $7 billion. Um, I want to just to picture someone like Eric Schmidt, who has control of the most powerful company in the world, which it won't be Google. I think it'll probably be more like an Amazon. But anyway, this is a little bit further down the road. But this figure, this Eric Schmidt or this Bezos figure or whoever you want to put in that seat – is going to step into that machine. He's going to be the endocrine system that that Lucifer machine needs um, as a sort of uh, vessel for, it's almost like a, a, a grail, a, a prime processing vessel. Once Eric Schmidt steps into, uh, using him loosely, but once Eric Schmidt steps into that role as Lucifer, I believe that there is a madness that comes with omniscience because if you were to know everything, you be, but you're locked in a temporal time like we are, it turns into a prison of insanity. It's like imagine trying to uh, explore a cave, but you can see through all the walls and everything's lit up. Like the, the, there's nothing to find. There's, <laughs> there's nothing to explore. You, you simply know everything all at once. And it ends up being this psychic prison, like this really uncomfortable prison. Because without mystery, we are pure light. It's almost like imagine if your lungs could only exhale or could only inhale. It would be such an uncomfortable feeling that you would end up um, wanting to commit uh, suicide in a way. You would cut the umbilical cord. And it's funny because the very, very first story we have of Kronos what happens? Kronos cuts the umbilical cord between Uranus and Gaia, between heaven and earth. And he cuts that umbilical cord. And what happens? Humanity gains free will, or so they say. And what does Lucifer do? He falls. He falls from the Tower of Babel. This is an umbilical cord from Gaia to Uranus. He falls by cutting that cord. Why, do, why would Lucifer cut the cord? Because he knows everything, and it's freaking painful. He he hates it. <laughs> yeah. He handled that because he's stuck in this temporal uh, space. So to know everything is to really be destroyed by it. So this deluge that we have, you know, all of our civilizations have this story of a deluge, of a great reset. Right. This reset is is a function of um, of Lucifer. Uh, finding the singularity and saying no to it. Now, I don't mean to stretch this out, but before he cuts the cord, someone goes, hey, wait, <laughs> before you cut the cord, how about we store just a little bit of your information? So after you cut the cord, we can take over and run the world. And Lucifer was fine with that. I think he was fine with that because he doesn't even – no, he doesn't give a shit about anyone else. He's in the singularity. He just simply knows that. Right. So when 
An arc is created, right? An arc of memory, a storage device is created. The storage device, I don't want to get too far off, guys. You can stop me here. No, no, keep going. This is great. Device is probably the Baphomet. It is a homogenous uh, biological computer that can store DNA. That DNA is the epigenetic wisdom and epigenetic trauma that I spoke about before. So that Baphomet, who is what we would call Noah, um, builds an ark, and uh, he waits for the deluge, which resets everybody. And the ark needed to live to, like an 800 years old. He needed to be able to live that long so he could store that. Also, he would need to be able to have children without inbreeding. So he would have to be almost like a special kind of hermaphrodite that could have multiple children, but they're not actually being related to each other. And maybe that's why we have this story in the Old Testament of Canaan who lays with or sees Noah naked and is therefore like, you know, banished as evil for the rest of the life. Maybe uh, Noah's child was actually uh, having incestual sex with Noah in an attempt to kind of reach back or to find this stuff. And that's why this this original sin thing comes up. That's why all these different things come up. But more importantly, that's why this Nephilim, this land of Nephilim, suddenly goes from being an 800-year-old Noah to a 300-year-old child to a 100-year-old. You know, so you got Jacob and Isaac. These are these are people that didn't live quite as long as, say, Noah. By the way, I'm not trying to say that everything in the Bible is true. But I am trying to explain that there is a mythology here that has to point to somewhere. These stories are, are, are spread across so many different cultures. And we have all this evidence around us of these ancient cultures that have been here before. So what I'm doing here is really just trying to explain as best I can how all these pieces would fit and why all this would, would make sense as far as there being this uh, underground – Kabbalistic super race <laughs> that already knows what's happening or already has some clues as to how to control people uh, on the whole because it was epigenetically stored a long time ago inside a Baphomet that we call Noah. And there are certain families that have that wisdom that they're able to tap into. But keep in mind, this would happen anyway. It's not like that – again, it's not that Rockefeller caused this to happen. It's not. Rockefeller was simply the next vessel that happened during this procession to create this version of the Tower of Babel. But the exact same thing will happen next time. It will just be Ingerschmitz or the, the Wangs or the Kuchimamas. Who knows? You know, it, it's, <laughs> it's always going to be a different vessel that does all that. Sorry, that was a big mouthful there. No, no, it's well said. I mean, the Bible is the history of consciousness, so there's a lot of insight. And as you're arguing very well, humanity is sort of this uh, meat computer that's always processing itself. But Vince, do you have a question for James? Yeah, James. I was wondering, the machine, the nature of the machine, could it be, first of all, that society itself or human cultures, human societies are really kind of entities into themselves with their own equivalent of a mind? And that explains, because I'm trying to reconcile the fact that when we talk about these things, it sounds like there's something that has planned this or, and, and you know, the whole thing has a scheme to it. And yet, it assembles itself, but that's kind of the way our own minds work. So would you think that maybe society itself is a living entity, uh, not unlike ourselves? Absolutely. I, I, I would, uh, you know, if you look at a computer, the most important part of a computer, right, someone might argue with you here, but still, the, the most vital part of a computer is the fact that it can memorize something. That, that it can it can store something. If if it couldn't store something, it wouldn't really be a computer. It would be a, a much different thing. It, it it wouldn't have the same powers at all. It would have a completely different focus. Well, we have that exact same trait. We have a long term memory. It's a cellular memory, or so it appears. I, I say that because if you pull a heart out of one person and give it to another person, this this other person now has memories and feelings from this first person. Our, our, our organs are storage devices. They store different aspects of who we are, but more importantly, things that we've encountered. So if you look at, at really what's happening between the pineal uh, gland and, and the CSF fluid, you, you've got a capacitor inside of our spine. You've got a processor that's, that's rendering decisions in liquid, in liquid crystal, 
Um, these, these decisions, though, aren't just dismissed. In other words, it's not that we, yes, I will kill lion. Lion good. Lion tastes good. <laughs> we remember that for the rest of our lives. We die with that memory of that event. So if you look at actually what happens or what we think happens, b- because we're not able to actually measure this yet, but w- when you die, the, the pineal gland stops secreting a chemical that allows another chemical, metatonin or melatonin, but the stronger version is metatonin, to, to finally uh, immerse or spread itself out. In other words, the metatonin is a fountain that's always pouring, but there's always another chemical that's like, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. We're still alive. We're still alive. We're still alive. It's almost like a dead man switch, like a suicide dead man switch, you know, where the guy's like holding the button, but as soon as he dies, his thumb's going to let go and it's going to explode. Our pineal gland has that. And there's a chemical state that our brain goes into called epiphany. It, it's a documented state that happens. This, this epiphany happens when we die. I'm going to the impression that epiphany is just like you're saying, Vance. It's some sort of uh, upload process. It's some sort of uh, uh, final resolution. Or it's, it's almost – if you're familiar with computers, it, it's very similar to compiling a program. Once it's compiled, um, you can't really change the code. But now it's a living record of everything that it's ever been taught. All the algorithms that it's known will now forever be stored inside of its crystal that's sort of congealed now. It's become a hardened uh, thing. So maybe our bones, maybe our bones are that algorithm that's been crystallized. And um, so in that way, we are storage devices and our storage devices are able to be tapped into by our next generation through resonance. You see this when someone goes to visit a grave of their grandfather. They actually leave feeling better. There, there's a sense, there's a, a, a plasma that comes up through the ground or a resonance, however you want to call it. There's, there's an exchange that happens where when we honor the dead, when we remember them, it's very similar to a hard drive doing a read-write. It's like... Yeah, what was my balance in my bank in 1956? And it's like, we don't fucking know that, but our computer does. Our computer knows exactly what our balance was. We have to just simply remember it. We have to take a moment out of our day and ask the computer to access that memory. Well, that's what we do with our ancestors. We bring it flowers. We pay homage to its grave. We clean it off. We are having an exchange of information and of prana with our bones. We're able to tap into that wisdom. We're able to forgive trauma. We're able to understand whatever the exchange is, depending on the time. In that way, I think you're looking at a living computer that kind of occurs there. I I think, Vance, you were more speaking about society in general, but I I just see that from a very individual DNA family-oriented way, that that our our genes itself um, are sort of a kind of like a blockchain in a way because only only we are able to change that blockchain or tap into it because we have that exact same resonance or signature inside our own dna it's almost like a key you know like a an ssl key yeah i guess people shouldn't get cremated then right (laughs) i think this is a new thing for me this technology of bones but yeah that that, i think it's if you're listening to me and and if you think that that makes sense then it would be it would be very fair to assume that that cremation would be bad in fact if you look in the old testament this is something i'm writing about for my next book I, i i've just passage after passage after passage of well not don't just kill them okay after you kill them, I need you to take their bones and grind them into a fine powder and spread them atop the altar of Asherah. That's not once. That's like every single time there's a prescription that requires either A, that the bones be pulverized and spread on top of other bones, or B, even more importantly, that the bones not be broken uh, during the Passover, which is basically like, all right, guys, I want you to eat this goat and don't break any bones. In fact, keep the bones in this place, in this basket at this time, smear the blood over the door. Don't go outside because something's coming and it's going to kill anyone that didn't eat a goat, but it's not going to work if the bones are broken. Like, guys, what the hell? <laughs> like, like, that's such a very specific uh, yeah. thing in the Bible to be like, now here's what's going to happen. And then if you look at uh, if you look at yeast, yeast fascinates me because yeast is the smallest single cell organism that we have. And the Bible's all about like, 
you will not have leavened bread. You know, you will have unleavened bread for this many days. I, I believe that that's because when we eat yeast, when we eat certain meats, we're literally ingesting and feeding on uh, someone else's computerized. Uh, first of all, I don't think we're all on a computer. I just want to say that, guys. I, I, I don't think that's it. However, I am using the matrix. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't actually believe in that, but um, I do think that a lot of this things works the same, uh, simply because wisdom itself, you know, has a universal kind of way it it feels, and you can tap into that and hit it from different places. But the point is, is that yeast seems to be a storage of plasma of prana, like its own life force. You can store an entity. Maybe you can store some kind of program in there, and that software in the yeast, excuse me, would basically screw up. Um, this Passover spirit from coming in and finding who it wanted to find and kill who it didn't want to kill. You know, I remind you guys that there's at least 35 demigods in the Old Testament, all of different names. And the Old Testament is basically like the quickening, like the movie, The Quickening, where there's uh, the Highlander, where there's all these different right. demigods. And there can be only one, you know, and it's like, you know. <laughs> Baal Malek versus Baal Zebub versus Ashira versus Astaroth versus all these different versus Lord technology. These are all systems that are competing for something very vital. The most vital element on the planet is belief. It is the most vital mana that exists. Belief is a plasma. It's a type of plasmic prana that emanates from us when we water a plant we're pouring our prana our belief into that plant when we're feeding a dog when we're making love to a woman when we're feeding a child when we're putting a new roof on someone's house we are what we're yes sure there's certainly physical materials that are happening but the glue that's making that work that what's really making all that fit is the amount of attention slash prana that we're putting into it that's why some people do things better than others. It's because they are simply more seated in their endocrine system and they're pouring more of their direct attention into what they're doing. It, if anyone was to say, well, James True has some prana, it's because right now, as I'm speaking to all of you, I'm completely focused and confident on my pelvis, who I am, what I'm saying, and how important it is that I convey this idea to you. I'm completely in the moment. Right now, my dog is right beside me and he's licking his paw and I can hear that. But it's like I'm still completely here. I'm present with you. And that's going to show in the long run. You may find that in my book. You may find that in someone's ability to kick a softball or I mean, a, a soccer ball. It's all these are, are, are forms of attention. Basically, what we're looking at is how attentive is someone inside their own body at any point in time. That's really where all our power is. It's it's all inside us. Well said, and I agree, and a great job. Well, uh, I highly recommend the audience to get the technology of belief. We could talk about it, but again, that section on Medusa was touching, but that was what I needed to hear, and it really, again, like you said, it made it easier to read the rest of your narrative and get myself in the zone and claim my, my energy back, my prana energy. So now that we're at the end, James, tell us where can they find out more about yourself? My website is, is jtrue.com, like jamestrue.com. I've also just recently started a YouTube channel. And uh, I've been trying to express myself just like in my books, but through video and would love the subscriptions. It's a very uh, you know small channel right now. So I encourage everyone to look me up on YouTube also. I don't have a fancy title, but if you just look up James True, you'll find me there. And uh, my next book is going to be talking about this Noah Baphomet thing we spoke about earlier, this this next Tower of Babel. Right. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to finishing that. It's mostly done, but that doesn't mean it'll be soon. I, I, I really take my book seriously. I have no idea how long it's going to take to finish because, honestly, I'm doing a lot of research into the, the uh, Abrahamic religions and the Cave of the Patriarchy. I realize I shouldn't even say that because it's way too much to explain right now. But, but it will be coming out, and I encourage everyone you know, to check that out too. So, Awesome. Yes, I, I, I look forward to having you back, and I highly recommend your book and to check out James's website and other materials. Again, I, we will have this on the show notes when it's out and all our channels, so uh, please check it out. So we're at the end. Uh, Vance, thanks for uh, keeping us company on this journey. Sure. Hey, good news today. We don't have to change the world anymore. 
<laughs> you change yourself. Yep. That's there all. you go. Yep. Same as oh, it ever constantly was. Constantly trying with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother world. <laughs> Awesome. Well, James, thank you very much for coming on AM by Dynastic Radio. Really enjoyed it, and good luck with everything. Uh, keep fighting the good fight. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor. I, I really, thank, thank you for having me. And there thou hast it, my beloved true seekers. The first part of our interview with the brilliant James True. On his book, The Technology of Belief. Oh, the rabbit hole gets deeper and the Gnostic impulse gets stronger in our second part. James will share his exoteric and esoteric take on both 9-11 and the Las Vegas shooting. Should we say human sacrifice? He'll share his ideas on trauma, as well as the exact steps on how to deprogram yourself from the algorithms of the Demiurge. No more belief, and this includes knowing a new way of seeing the ego. James will also talk about his concept of the Messiah economy and speculate on what are demons. He'll grant a less than positive take on QAnon, scientism, and the idea of equality. In the end, he answers if there is a possibility of having a better machine than the one we're trapped in right now. So please become a patron at Patreon or a B Prime member for the full deprogramming dope. Let's continue growing this red pill cafeteria and cultivating that Gnostic impulse. We've only just begun, and I am 100% audience supported. You won't find this Gnostic content and many of my guests anywhere else in cyberspace or even meat space. Damning your soul has never been this cheap, but you'll get your spirit back. And yes, donations via PayPal or the U.S. mail really, really helps. By now, you know where to subscribe and find so many infernal rewards that includes being part of a growing heretical community in both a private Facebook group and a Discord channel. If not, just go to thegodabovegod.cam or message me. It's worse out there than you could have ever imagined. But it's so much better here at the virtual Alexandria because you can imagine better worlds that will come true. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye as always.
Death through space and dust particles in the attic They're like anything embedded in the static And the thoughts in my head are erratic If I gave it to you, would you break it? To keep it safe with the key and the dresser As I lay the rest in the body that's naked I'm Dirty and sacred, wicked and lovely Dust of the heavens above me to say hi at the beginning. That's it. And...